So coming to today's session, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Hiren Panwala, who will be taking the Pediatric Neuroradiology Journal Club for us today. He'll be discussing an article on MR uh, pattern recognition in childhood bilateral basal ganglia disorders and also a few cases following that. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Hiren. He is a pediatric radiologist at NHSRCC Children's Hospital in Mumbai. His areas of interest are pediatric neuroimaging and pediatric chest imaging. He's done his fellowship in pediatric radiology at CMC Vellore and a short-term observership in pediatric neuroradiology at the Great Ormond Street Hospital in UK. He has several publications to his credit and also has authored several chapters in the upcoming IRI textbooks in various topics in pediatric neuroradiology and, and cardiac imaging. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Dr. Hiren, and over to you. You may please take over. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are, yeah. Yeah, so the screen is visible, like my PPT. Yeah, you can. Okay, okay, okay. So once again, uh, thank you, organizer, for giving me the opportunity to speak on this topic. So today we'll be discussing on this large uh, group of condition, which is bilateral basal ganglia disorders, and uh, uh, this is the article which was published published in the Brain Communication, 2020, and it's a retrospective study which was done across the multiple centers across the world. Which, which were located in Sydney, London, uh, Birmingham, Leeds, Portland, and Barcelona. So they had uh, reviewed 308, 308 uh, MRI scan and out of uh, 201 patients. And based on that, they have categorized some 93 diagnostic categories. Uh, here is, we can see that this is the uh, primary author, Dr. Shakib, uh, who has uh, collaborated with other uh, part of the country and uh, made this uh, a beautiful article. So we'll be discussing and going through this area. They have uh, given this wonderful way of uh, giving a graphical abstract. That was, uh, I was very happy to see this kind of way uh, abstract can be sent. So they have, what they have done that all the basic ganglia abnormality, they have clustered into different, different uh, categories. Like for example, uh, where putamine involvement, for example, with uh, globus pallidus involvement or other parts of the brain stem and other findings that will be going through this thing. And based on that, uh, they have given us an approach. So, uh, starting with the introduction, the basal ganglia, they are the paired deep gray white white metal structures, and uh, they comprise of caudate and butamine, which are known as triadum. Other thing is globus pallidus, which you all know, substantia nigra, subthalamic nucleus, and nucleus accumbens. These are the high energy dependent area. So, they are very vulnerable to toxic, hypoxic, or ischemic injury, and they have predilection for uh, many genetic and neurodegenerative disorders that we'll be going through. So uh, the thing is that approach to a bilateral basal ganglia is very difficult because there are a large number of disorders that can involve the basal ganglia, especially bilateral. And uh, the, the most important thing to evaluate a case of basal ganglia disease is clinical profile. We have to see first that uh, the presentation is acute, subacute, or chronic, whether the disease is static, uh, like for example, sequela of prior insult like HIE or hypoglycemia, or it is progressive, uh, like for example, neurodegenerative conditions like a neuro, uh, NCL, or uh, some neuro-regressive leukodystrophies like uh, GANAV and, and so on. And you should have some other clues like a patient presented with uh, encephalitis or movement disorder like exapiramidal symptoms or cerebellar sign. So this kind of uh, detailed history is very important approaching to a, a list of differential diagnoses. Then um, when we have taken this clinical context, uh, imaging pattern which will help us in narrowing further down the differentials. That we'll be seeing in subsequent slides how we can further down the differentials. And based on that, we can give or suggest targeted investigation in certain disorder so that we can save a cost also and uh, we can directly point them that uh, this abnormality can be seen in certain metabolic pathways and we can uh, do the test regarding or limited to those areas. So this was the multi-center study which bring up, brings up the large cohort of patients and they have formulated a diagnostic algorithm how to go about and they have made a prototypic electronic decision-making tool also. We can uh, preview 
these things later and uh, at the end of this session they have made one uh, nice software that we can uh, access through the uh, online platforms and uh, we can try to solve our case also so uh, first of all we would like to revisit revisit the anatomy so basic anglia mainly they are made up of this thing uh, globus pallidus and corpus striatum so we can see here that uh, globus pallidus generally they are slightly more hypo intense as compared to the caudate nucleus and the putamen so this is the caudate nucleus and that is the putamen I mean, which is ventricular in shape, and the middle aspect of these two pair structures are the globus pallidus, which are slightly more hypointense as compared to the caudate nucleus and putamen. Here, this yellow colored structure is the uh, putamen, and uh, this red colored uh, structure outline area is the caudate nucleus. So, the caudate and putamen they are uh, almost iso indexed to the gray matter. So, that's the way we can uh, say whether it's they are abnormal or normal. And uh, uh, the globus pallidus will be slightly hypointense. So, that is about the uh, anatomy of the basal ganglia. There are a few other structures which, which comes under that basal ganglia circuit. One of them is the subthalamic nucleus. So the subthalamic nucleus, they are also a paired uh, structure, which is medial to the corticospinal tract. So you can see that this is the longitudinal slightly hypointense white matter tract, that is the corticospinal tract. So this subthalamic nucleus, they are located medial to this, and they will be uh, ventral to the thalamus uh, in this location. Then another thing is the nucleus acubens. So the nuclear acclumens is very difficult to see on MRI, but uh, here we can see that they are also a paired uh, structure and it is coming enter or infer to the corpus striatum. So that is the one number one label, it's the caudate nucleus. The second one is the, uh, the putamen. And uh, here we can see that the enter inferior aspect of the corpus striatum, that is the location of the uh, nucleus acclumens, which will be seen uh, in relation to the uh, anterior commission as seen on the sagittal view. Yeah, so uh, coming to the, this article, uh, the material and methods, uh, so they have included all the children ranging from 0 to 18 years having bilateral basal ganglia abnormalities, either on 1.5 or 3 tesla MRI. Uh, their excluded criteria were that uh, they have excluded some conditions like uh, disorders of neuronal migration disorder, uh, migration or neoplastic uh, conditions like basal ganglia germinoma or neurofibromatosis. They also have excluded uh, any cerebrovascular insult related uh, basal ganglia injury as well as unilateral basal ganglia. So all the cases they have selected, uh, they were having bilateral basal ganglia. They also defined the disease categories uh, as per the uh, latest uh, journal and peer reviewed articles. And uh, these are the some examples of uh, these conditions like ADM, uh, NAC, basal ganglia encephalitis, which can be autoimmune and all. So that you can go ahead, uh, on, it is available online in a supplementary table too with this article. And you can use this definition uh, for the particular disease. Uh, they also uh, had done a cohort of this 201 uh, patient as well as done a peer review publications to incorporate certain other conditions which were not, not included in this study uh, to widen the scopes of uh, all the clusters and uh, which can be comprehensive in nature. The patient database, they were mainly uh, taken as uh, children hospital basement in Sydney, as well as Great Ormond Street Hospital in UK. And uh, it was a retrospective uh, study. They also developed an MRI rating and uh, performa. So you can see that this is the glimpse of the uh, performa, how they have um, evaluated each patient on MRI. So you can see that uh, they have individually uh, labeled each structure here, quadrate putamen, globus pallidus, substantial nigra, uh, subthalamic nucleus. And uh, depending on various signal, uh, various signal intensity on different sequences, they have made this kind of columns. So they have included multiple uh, categories, uh, whether the on T2 they are hyper, hypo, they are symmetrical or, or asymmetrical, different there is restriction or not. They are having susceptibility or low signal intensity on SWR or T2 star uh, technique. Uh, how is the appearance on T1 weighted images? And is there any enhancement on post -catalogium? So these are the parameters they had used for each case. Uh, they also had uh, evaluated extra cytal changes, those patients who had basal abnormality. They have evaluated uh, other part of the brain also, like for example, gray matters of the superficial structures, white matter, whether white matter was only periventricular, deep white matter, or how is, was there any uh, specific locations of abnormality. They also included, is there any midline structure involvement or cerebellum brainstem involvement? Uh, they have uh, also incorporated the uh, like other findings like how is the myelination pattern, whether it's hypomyelination, delayed myelination, and uh, whether the hypothalamus is involved or not. So this, it was very comprehensive uh, review and uh, this many parameters were used. 
and uh, so they have included 23 MRI features, which was based on the MRI abnormality as well as uh, type of the MRI abnormality. So, for example, the signal intensity that we have already discussed. And based on that, they have done cluster analysis, uh, which which was based on this agglomerative hierarchical uh, clustering analysis using our software. And based on that, uh, they came up with uh, this kind of basic angular abnormality, which can be grossly uh, scattered in this kind of four type kind of cluster, in which uh, this uh, orange color uh, cluster represent uh, cluster one, which indicates uh, this patient had predominant T2 weighted hyperintensity in putamen or striatum, like quadrate nucleus also. Then the cluster B is this kind of light green color uh, in which we can see that in this uh, cohort or in this cluster, they have included those patients who had either T2 weighted hyperintensity in robust pallidus or who had uh, SWI uh, blooming or susceptibility. So that was the uh, cluster two. In cluster three, they have included uh, the, those reasons who had robust pallidus involvement, plus those who were having T2 hyperintensity, as well as in addition, uh, those who had brainstem and cerebellum with restricted diffusion. So there was a uh, quite overlap between these two conditions, the cluster two and cluster three that we can see on the figure all itself. And the cluster four was uh, more isolated and uh, it was showing that T1 weighted uh, hyper intensity on basal angular without uh, any restricted difference or susceptibility. So they came up with uh, this kind of more, uh, four kind of categories. So total uh, 305 brain scan were evaluated. And uh, in this study, they identified 34 diagnostic category, but they reviewed and uh, then the diagnostic category were increased uh, by the uh, review of literature from other journals and all and that diagnostic category increased up to 93 so that's a large data and uh, out of this uh, 201 patient 84 had uh, two or more sequential scan also were available so they have done a follow-up of those patients also in which they were finding the follow-up scans uh, there was some uh, findings like certain disease for example mitochondrial current science syndrome and so on they has they have overlapping features like for example they would have initially presented as a cluster one disease, but then on follow-up scan, they would have shown additional hyperintensity in global spheridus and so on. So they had this kind of uh, overlapping features in these conditions that will be seen in the subsequent um, this article. So this is the uh, table which is showing that uh, the, the claims of the entire study that they have included this kind of 34 diagnostic group, which included uh, this kind of metabolic disorder to neurodegenerative disorders to uh, some sort of HIE, uh, then inflammatory conditions like ADM, uh, ANEC. So it was a large group and uh, they tried to, to sort it out by cluster. So first of all, we'll uh, start with the cluster one, that is the bilateral butaminal or striatal hyperintensity. So that was a major group in this study and uh, 91 patient out of 201 patient had this kind of butaminal or striatal hyperintensity and they came up with uh, 15 categories in this study out of which uh, the majority of were them ADEM uh, and then followed by propionic acid uh, We'll be seeing now uh, interesting cases in this uh, cluster only and their peculiar features and what are the clinical findings and uh, the teaching point within the, these clusters only. So we'll start with the, the first uh, case that is the glutaric acid urea type one. So the glutaric acid urea type one, the classical presentation that the child might have macrocephaly, they uh, have encephalopathic crisis just after a followed by a trivial trauma or, or fever or in, uh, any infection. And if you do MRI, this child will have this kind of classical uh, abnormality in the form of, you will see the few swelling of the bilateral basal ganglia, predominantly the uh, quadrate and putamen, that is a striatum. They can involve the globus pallidus also. Uh, other thing that this child may have this kind of subdural effusions or subdural hemorrhage, which is uh, shown by this kind of green dash arrow. And uh, they will have this classical under opercularization of the temporal poles that we can see anteriorly here because, uh, and they will that will lead to this kind of widening of the sylvian fissure and that gives rise to appearance of the back ring. So when you see this kind of uh, history, and uh, this classical imaging finding, you can straight away give uh, a possibility of uh, possibility of this kind of uh, glutaric acid urea type one. The other differential for this kind of subdural hemorrhage uh, would be a non accident injury, but uh, non accident injury will not have this kind of termin and quadrate nucleus swelling. So then in that way, we can differentiate uh, those kind of differential disorders from the glutaric acid urea type one. Moving on to the second entity, uh, when you see this kind of uh, involvement of the basal ganglia, symmetrical, quadrate nucleus, and uh, 
putamen with uh, if you see here there is sparing of the periventricular and deep white matter in the bilateral cerebral hemisphere and uh, there is involvement of the subcortical white matter you can see they are, they are symmetric and uh, there is some gradient so the anteriorly in the frontal lobe the findings are more uh, conspicuous and as compared to the posterior aspect and uh, here we can see that there is some uh, involvement of the dentate nucleus also so this condition is called uh, l2 hydroxyglutaric aciduria so when you see this kind of combination with uh, sparing of the thalamus uh and classical involvement of this kind of dented nucleus which is seen in almost all cases of this patient then you can uh, raise this possibility of uh, possibility of uh, l2 hydroxyglutaric aciduria the teaching point here would be that uh, imaging features are uh, characteristic and uh, this lesions sometimes they can predispose to brain tumor so it's important to uh, follow up these patients so this is a, this is a case of uh, l2 hydroxyglutaric aciduria we have to the another uh, type of metabolic abnormality which can affect the basal ganglia with uh, hyper intensity of the uh, striatum and putamen is propionic acidemia so the propionic acidemia they have two kind of uh, form either they can present early in life or later in uh, uh, later in older childhood age group the uh, early presentation in the neonatal age group they present with uh, hypotonia lethargy seizure uh, uh, and choreoarthritic movements uh the the classical clue would be that in some many of the patient they have this kind of uh, ventral lateral or uh, central uh, linear hyperintensity in the thalamus this is this is not in all cases but uh, in this cohort in this study they have found that many patient had this kind of uh, uh, abnormality in the uh, ventral lateral or central part so the thing is that if you don't see that doesn't exclude propionic acidemia but if it is seen that that will be a clue towards this condition they can have dentate nucleus hyperintensity also as you can see in this image so uh, they have observed that uh, in older children in the basal ganglia uh, in older children the basal ganglia was more commonly involved as compared to the neonatal age group in neonatal age group there is one another different uh, kind of uh, mri imaging finding you can see that will be involvement of the cortical and subcortical white matter which can show restricted diffusion in the acute phase so so these are the uh, hallmark features of the propionic acidemia and we want to the there are some lesions which will be almost near csf signal intensity as we can see here and they are almost cavitary or uh, vacuolating lesions which are symmetrical so when you see this kind of symmetrical cavitary or vacuolating lesion which has almost csf signal intensity which is involving the cord and putamen with relative sparing of the globus pallidus um, and in this patient uh, we can see there is uh, evidence of cerebellar atrophy as evident by this kind of interfolar space widening as well and uh, you can see that this is the mrs which is done on one uh, which is run on low t 35 that's why we are seeing large repeat lactate peak here if you do 140 40 you can see that inversion of uh, this peak so that's a lactate peak and uh, this condition is is known as leak disease so this this is can be caused caused by multiple mitochondrial complex gene deficiency uh, here the clinical history that the patient might be having uh, subacute necrotizing encephalopathy and uh, the lesions are spongy form and uh, you can the patient present with cranial palsy and ophthalmopathy so that symmetric so here the clue would be symmetrical areas of necrosis of the basal ganglia or cystic changes uh, another thing i want to uh, convey here that uh, many patients will have uh, striatal atrophy on follow up scans so initially it was thought that this striatal atrophy is because of post streptococcal infection or it happens only in mitochondrial diseases it's not the case striatal atrophy has many uh, many uh, diseases which can follow it. like this is a long list of uh, differentials which can cause striatal atrophy so it's not a specific finding so we should stop uh, writing when we see striatal atrophy only few disorder there's a long list then uh, moving on to another disease which can be diagnosed on mri is this condition so the child uh, presents with uh, macrocephaly and uh, neuroregression with and motor delay and uh, if you see that what is the classical finding in this uh, child is that symmetrical areas of white matter hyper intensity which is having more uh, predominant dominant in the frontal lobe as compared to the parieto occipital region and you can see that there is hyper intensity and almost uh, swelling and cystic looking areas of the uh, cord nucleus as well as some portion of the put, uh, putamen as well uh, the, the another classical finding you will see in this kind of patient is that uh, this kind of uh, post contrast enhancement along the ventricular margin it's almost look like garland and the same area will be seen as a as a t2 hypo intense band uh, along the periventricular area so when you see this kind of conglomeration of finding in a infant with this kind of of uh, history uh, you can 
raise the possibility of uh, Alexander disease. So the teaching point here is that uh, Garland sign and Alexander's uh, disease also can have optic asthma technique. Optic asthma technique can be seen in other disorders also that will be seen later. Then uh, in this group, uh, in this condition, they have found in this article that uh, there was certain disorder which, which had rim surrounding the putamen. So these are the examples uh, uh, which can have rim surrounding the putamen in this uh, article. So one is the uh, myelinolysis. So myelinolysis happens uh, when there is rapid correction of the sodium or it can be seen uh, certain conditions like hematological malignancy or SLE or diabetes mellitus or in any other electrolyte imbalance can cause this kind of myelinolysis. So you will see this kind of peripheral hyperintensity and swelling of the putamen as we can see here. They can also involve the uh, thalamus and the dorsal brainstem. So that is, these are the typical imaging features of the myelinolysis. There is a uh, relative sparing of the ventral thalamus. Uh, that is that we have to see, observe. So when you see this kind of uh, imaging finding with this kind of uh, history, uh, we can make uh, that this could be due to myelinolysis. And uh, the MRI changes, they are reversible, uh, but they take uh, weeks to months to resolve on MRI. Then another uh, very severe fulminant uh, condition which can have this kind of appearance, uh, this is the fulminant encephalopathy, which can affect the infant and children. And uh, it can be caused by various uh, viral infection like influenza, rotavirus, HSV. And now in the current scenario, COVID also can uh, produce this kind of uh, lesions. So these are the uh, multiple bilateral near symmetrical uh, necrotic lesions in the basal ganglia and as well as in the thalamide. So thalamide bilateral symmetricity is the hallmark of this area, which involvement of this uh, putamen and gaudet nucleus. They can uh, show this kind of uh, trilaminar pattern of the ADC in which the central era will show us necrosis or a hemorrhage and uh, that will be high signal intensity on ADC surrounded by this kind of restricted different low uh, ADC value uh, which indicates cytotoxic edema and peripheral this kind of uh, again facilitated diffusion which is showing the vasogenic edema. So when you see a child with uh, this kind of acute encephalitis and uh, Permanent course, and uh, when you see this kind of imaging pattern, you can see that this is most likely to be anec, and uh, they can treat, uh, they can start steroid and uh, save the child. So, thalamic hemorrhage, uh, punctate, they are a classical hallmark, and uh, this kind of uh, trilaminal pattern seen on ADC map, you should look for that, and uh, that could be giving away. And sometimes uh, this anec can be secondary to genetic conditions like RANB. B2 mutation also that we have to uh, take into consideration. Then uh, sometimes uremia also can have similar kind of pattern with the uh, swelling of the corpus striatum with relative sparing of the globus pallidus and surrounding this putaminal uh, rim surrounding the putamen. Uh, autoimmune encephalitis, yes, it's, it, it is a disorder that uh, we are not able to prove it uh, even though doing multiple uh, laboratory examination. But uh, this patient, usually the swelling is homogeneous and uh, hyperintensity is also homogeneous. Uh, as compared to the patchy distribution, in, which is seen in ADEM or other conditions. When, if you don't treat this patient, they can go into progressive atrophy of the basal ganglia. As we can see here, this is the follow-up skin of the same patient. And uh, the uh, usual antibody, which is diagnosed is antidopa 2 receptor antibody. There can be other autoimmune antibody also, which can give rise to this kind of pattern. Uh, but the clue here is that uh, clinical history and uh, Lab, lab parameters showing some inflammatory markers raised in the CSF and uh, the symmetrical and diffuse uh, homogeneous appearance that is the autoimmune encephalitis. Then uh, this Wilson disease we all know. We all know Wilson disease that uh, if you see bilateral basal ganglia, thalamine, and brainstem involvement and uh, in the brainstem you will see this kind of uh, classical uh, face of giant panda sign in which uh, you will see this kind of uh, high signal intensity in the midbrain tegmentum with uh, sparing of the red nucleus which gives rise to this uh, face of the giant panda and uh, there is one more sign which is called as face of the uh, miniature panda which is seen at the pontine segment by tegmental level so when you see this kind of imaging uh, findings with uh, history of uh, cashier fletcher wings and uh, history suggestion of tremor or behavioral changes and dysphagia you can uh, give possibility and you can give appropriate investigations and uh, we can make a diagnosis of uh, wilson disease then moving ahead to there is uh, one more uh, condition which can cause subacute and recurrent encephalopathy or movement disorder and dystonia followed by uh, febrile disease. So this is a condition which involves the corpus striatum. Here we can see that chorate nucleus and putamen. This condition also have this kind of symmetrical or asymmetrical areas of cortical and subcortical white matter hy uh, hyper intensities on uh, flare or T2 weighted images as well as cerebral cortex involvement. 
which can show uh, reduced diffusivity on uh, acute phase, which can uh, be resolved over time after treatment if we give uh, biotin uh, at appropriate time. And uh, you can see that this is the acute phase, how the lesions can be angry and swollen and which can have this kind of peripheral hyperintensity. So uh, there is typical spelling of the globus pellitus as you can notice here. And that is the follow-up scan. Here we can see that there is some residual uh, atrophy and signal changes in the basal ganglia are persisting, but uh, the gray matter, cortical gray matter signals have uh, resolved. So that is the common uh, pattern what we see in bi biotin responsive basal ganglia disease. So the genetic gene mutation involves SLC19A3 mutation. So this, uh, this differential we should consider whenever we have imaging appearance of these kind of conditions, and we only will be focusing on mitochondrial panel and all. So it's always uh, uh, advisable to also look for biotin thiamine responsive basal ganglia disease. Okay. Then we on to the ADEM. This is the classical examples of uh, ADEM, how it can uh, involve. So the usual history will be that the child will have a prior uh, uh, upper respiratory tract infection one week or two weeks before. And uh, if you do CSF, the CSF will be unremarkable. There won't be any uh, high cells. Uh, but the child would have presented with encephalopathy, which would have been followed by fever or something. Uh, here, the lesions will be either deep gray or they can have more of a predominant subcortical. The lesions are poorly defined to fluffy and uh, they are predominant white metal lesions. So when you see this kind of asymmetrical, poorly defined uh, white metal lesions, which can affect basal ganglia also, gray matter also, uh, then you can raise the possibility of ADM. And it has got good response to steroid and the uh, lesions can resolve. Uh, the patient, uh, those who have uh, ADM secondary to walk, they can have tumor effective or mass forming lesions as you can see here on this uh, second image. Then there are some certain conditions which have, which have partial sparing of the regions of the putamen or corpus striatum. So it is not necessary that uh, entire putamen or quadrate should be homogeneously involved. There are certain conditions which can involve a uh, patchy area, but that can be uh, symmetric. For example, this is the example of uh, uh, Magdal syndrome. So when you see this kind of putaminal eye sign, so what you are seeing here that uh, there is symmetrical areas of hyperintensity in the bilateral putamen with sparing of the mid part of the uh, putamen. And uh, these uh, patients present with uh, progressive psychomotor regression, deafness and dystonia. So when you see in an acute uh, case, uh, you will see this kind of mid-putamen sparing and that will be a pathognomonic or hallmark for this condition. Uh, but when you see this patient later on, uh, later age group, then you can see that uh, there is a significant atrophy of the brain with uh, uh, also involvement of the mid part of the that putamen which was spared initially. So it is not necessary that when you see this kind of homogeneous uh, hyperintensity later, you can exclude MacDill. But if you see in the initial phase, you will see this kind of pattern, which is called as putaminal eye sign. Then uh, there are certain mitochondrial or disorders are there. For example, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex deficiency. Uh, they can involve this kind of posterior putamen and just globus pellitus. Uh, clinically, they have identical leak like syndrome. And uh, here we can see that this is the uh, involvement which can so restrict it if you're in the acute phase. So when you see this kind of symmetrical uh, lesions which are restricting uh, in acute phase, you can raise a possibility of this kind of uh, mitochondrial or pyruvate dehydrogenase complex deficiency. Uh, another example of mitochondrial complex file uh, gene deficiency, which is showing that posterior putamen involvement, in addition of uh, this kind of brainstem tracts involvement, as you can see surrounding the uh, aqueduct of sylvius uh, and uh, surround this dorsal ponds as well as dorsal medulla. Uh, then this is one condition that we should not be mistaking as a metabolic disorder because when we tell that uh, this is looking like this then we are helping the clinician that uh, to avoid unnecessary investigation as this disease is static one insult happened happened whatever damage has was has to be there it has already done so uh, when you see this kind of classical uh, posterior putamen and ventral thalamide involvement on t2 and uh, flare images uh, also they can involve the posterior aspect of the uh, internal capsule with associated uh, areas of abnormality involving the periglonic iri, uh, involving the cortex and uh, subcortical white metal, which in acute case can show restricted different, but on chronic case, they can show volume loss and parenchymal thinning. So when you see this kind of uh, pattern with uh, classical imaging uh, history or, or clinical history suggestive of uh, prior insult, perinatal insult, or any anterior risk factor, you can uh, raise possibility of, or you can confirm that this is look like more of a uh, perinatal HIE kind of pattern, which is profound. And uh, by that way, we can avoid unnecessary investigations like metabolic or genetic. And that is the one way we can really help uh, to the clinician. So this is also known as chronic type of cerebral palsy. 
So now moving on to the cluster two uh, of uh, this study. So the cluster two included T2 hyperintensity or, or increased susceptibility of the globus pallidus. And these are some case examples of the cluster uh, two, which will be going uh, in subsequent slides. So um, cluster two had total 85 uh, patients, 85 patients and uh, several conditions and which is uh, listed here and uh, which consists of so many uh, lysosomal sodium disorder to metabolic conditions as we'll see in a subsequent example. So first we'll start with the globus pallidus T2 hyperintensity without striatal abnormality. So this is a list of uh, conditions that they have provided in their uh, article. So that's a good list of conditions when we find this kind of T2 hyperintensity of the globus pallidus. Without striatal involvement, you can uh, refer to these uh, conditions and always look at the entire scan. Is there any other irrational involvement or not? So we'll start with the uh, first of all uh, more common things which can be found. This is also uh, one condition which is like a which is which can have static pose because the insert would happen in uh, neonatal time. So that is the chronic terrace. Uh, so the patient will, will have typically a history of hyperbilinemia during the uh, NICU period. And here we can see that the, the hyperintensity in the globus pallidus is more of a diffuse and uh, homogeneous T2 hyperintensity. And uh, you should look for other areas of involvement in, in a case of uh, chronic terrace, like for example, subthalamic nucleus uh, involvement as well as the hippocampi. Uh, if the, these are also involved, then uh, you can raise the possibility of uh, chronic terrace. So the chronic terrace in the acute changes, they can have even hyperintensity in those areas. And they can show restricted different in the acute stage, but later stage they can have atrophy of those areas and residual uh, globus pallidus hyperintensity. Then another important metabolic condition when you see uh, predominant globus pallidus involvement only without any other areas of involvement, that is the uh, SSADS, that is this uh, succinate semi-aldehyde uh, dehydrogenase deficiency. And uh, here we can see that initially many of the, this uh, study showed that uh, this patient had anterior globus pallidus involvement. The posterior aspect of the globus pallidus was relatively spared. And uh, there was uh, dented nucleus involvement also in few of the cases. So when you see this kind of uh, pattern with uh, globus pallidus and dented, you always uh, include SSADH in your differentials. And uh, if you timely treat this patient with uh, uh, Vyga veteran, then you can see that uh, there is resolution of those hyperintensity as which was seen previously. And uh, this condition happens either in late infancy or early childhood with movement disorders. So this kind of pattern is very important to diagnose this condition. Then moving on to the methyl malonic aciduria. Methyl malonic aciduria is also one of the conditions when we see symmetrical areas of uh, globus pallidus hyperintensity. When it is severe, it can show cystic changes also and with the surrounding this kind of peripheral hyperintensity because of uh, cavitary changes. Uh, methyl malonic aciduria can be having non-specific finding because of, uh, as volume loss or some uh, periventricular hyperintensity. But when we see isolated this kind of uh, GP abnormality uh, in early in life with uh, vomiting, tachypnea, lethargy, seizures history, we should include uh, methyl malonic aciduria as a strong possibility. And uh, this patient can have cystic changes or calcification at later age, as we discussed already. The clue here is that we can diagnose this condition by doing laboratory test. So the urinary organic acid, acid profile will show elevated methyl malonic acid here. So that, in that way, we can uh, come up to the diagnosis. Uh, then another um, interesting thing is that cerebral creatine deficiency. Cerebral creatine deficiency, we all know that uh, many times the MRI uh, findings, conventional imaging will be normal, already absolutely normal, but the patient will be having some symptoms. And uh, if you do MR spectroscopy, that will be the clinching. For example, here we can see that there was there is absent of the creatine peak at uh, 3 ppm. So that is almost uh, pathognomonic for the uh, cerebral creatine deficiency. Uh, some of this uh, deficiency, they can have globus pallidus hyperintensity as shown in this uh, condition, which is uh, more often seen with GAMD deficiency. Uh, but the AGAT deficiency with uh, creatine deficiency, they are having normal scan uh, uh, that we have to uh, see. So the clue here is that we have to do MR spectroscopy also in those kind of disorder to reach up to the diagnosis. Uh, then moving on to the another disorder which can have uh, globus pallidus hyperintensity is the Canavan disease. So the Canavan disease, they can have subcortical or diffuse white matter involvement with uh, typical uh, globus pallidus thalamus uh, involvement. They can involve brain cell and cerebellum also. Uh, the disease presents with macrocephaly and hypotonia with optic atrophy. And uh, here, additionally, clue will be that if you do MR spectroscopy at 
and uh, uh, that you will see this kind of marked disproportionate elevation of the NAV. Okay, so we have to consider canavian disease whenever we see a macrocephalic child with a deep gray environment, which is sparing the striatum. And if you see some subcortical white matter environment. Uh, another condition which can cause uh, symmetrical GP hyperintensity is current cell disease. Uh, this is very important to diagnose. We have to look carefully at the clinical history. Uh, when you have cardiac condition defects and uh, patient is having oculocraniosomatic disorder, uh, like for example, progressive external optoneoplasia and having additional retinal pigmentation, then uh, if you see this kind of subcortical white matter environment with uh, symmetrical GP environment, and uh, sometimes this patient can have thalamus and uh, dented nucleus environment. So when you see this kind of uh, abnormality, you can uh, raise a possibility or, uh, or add a differential diagnosis in that. So in this uh, study done by uh, Dr. Shakib, uh, they have found that uh, kind of sad disease, they can have cystic changes in the uh, globus pallidus. They found three patients had this kind of uh, abnormality. Then uh, it is not uh, uncommon that we see the hyperintensity involving the pallidum as well as triadum both. So in this kind of both uh, hyperintensity will be high overlapping in cluster one and cluster two. So in that in this study, they have found in certain mitochondrial disorders as well as as well as propanic acidemia and, and pyruvic dehydrogenase deficiency. However, they went for literature review to expand the this kind of uh, disease abnormality, and they found that this many other diseases which can have concomitant uh, palatal and striatal due to hyperintensity. Then now we'll move on to the like uh, global pallidus increased susceptibility or hypointensity. So the disorder which includes predominantly are uh, NBIA or NBI mimics. Uh, then certain examples like uh, tube BB, uh, tube BB4 or NCL cocaine syndrome. This uh, disorders have some classical imaging finding that we'll be discussing. So starting with the NBI disorder. So when you see this kind of uh, image with uh, extrapyramidal symptoms. And initially, this child can have this kind of uh, symmetrical areas of hyperintensity in the, in the globus pallidus. But as the time progresses, uh, you will see the subsequent uh, T2 hypointensity with sparing of the anteromedial part of the globus pallidus. So that is called as uh, eye of a tiger sign. So when you see this kind of eye of a tiger or tiger sign, uh, you are sure that this is looking like a peak and that is pentothin kinase dissociated uh, uh, neurodegeneration. This uh, patient also have this kind of substantial nigra environment. Uh, the susceptibility can be seen uh, at this level also. So the clue is that eye of a tiger, it is a hallmark for this condition. But when you see early, then it can have only this kind of uh, hyper intensity on the medial aspect. And when you see later of uh, late aspect of the same child, you can see that uh, this medial aspect also has been replaced by T2 hyper intensity or a subploid blooming. So uh, it, it, we cannot exclude PK and if we don't see eye of tiger sign, that is the uh, take-home point. Then another condition which uh, can have uh, susceptibility is the eye net. So this is one of the conditions that we can uh, diagnose on imaging. So when you see on imaging this kind of uh, T2 hypointensity on the globus pallidus, which is showing susceptibility on the SWI, and if you see this kind of cerebellar hyperintensity as well as atrophy, we can see that the, the craniocordial diameter of the vermis is not reaching up to uh, this uh, obex region. So that is definitely atrophy with uh, interfolial space widening. And if you carefully notice that uh, there is a uh, relative hyperintensity of the cortex also. So when you see that cerebellar cortex hyperintensity uh, with uh, this kind of finding, uh, like globus pallidus hyperintensity with uh, blooming and uh, drooping of the sphingum is one of the feature in this condition, as well as you can see that uh, the clavel part will be hypertrophic. So when you see this constellation of finding, you can uh, raise a possibility of INET. Uh, again, uh, in the initial scan, you might not see all the features in this patient as uh, these uh, features evolve over time. So uh, like these findings, it is seen that it's pathognomonic, but if they are not seen in all constellation, then you cannot exclude the condition. Uh, this is the condition uh, which has specific appearance on SWI and uh, t 2 meter images. Uh, this condition is called as MPEN. And in MPEN, you will see that uh, there is a preferential involvement of the internal and external part of the globus pallidus with sparing of the uh, medial internal medullary lamina. Which will, which will be ISO intense or slightly bright. So when you see this kind of uh, ISO intense or slightly bright medial uh, internal medullary lamina separating the uh, internal and external, and which are showing susceptibility on SWI, you can uh, raise the possibility of uh, MPEN appropriate, inappropriate clinical conditions. And this is the same patient that they have 
image after some time and we can see that uh, there is progressive uh, more deposition of iron related uh, t2 uh, hypo intensity which can be progressive subsequently uh, this is another example of uh, nbi that is the b pen so here we can see that uh, involvement of the uh, substantial nigrides uh, classical but in the initial scan uh, they were not showing any susceptibility or any optimal signal intensity and over the uh, edges we can see that classical appearance so these patients have this kind of central uh, hello sign which is even hyper intense and which will have in this kind of central areas of hypo intensity so when you see this kind of uh, imaging appearance which will have hello with central band of hypo intensity on x1 weighted images in a substantial nigra that is uh, classical for this condition which is called as bpen that is the beta propeller associated neurodegeneration which comes comes under the spectrum of nbi then there are certain disorders which are nbi mimics uh, this disorders includes the uh, lysosomal storage disorders for example that we'll be seeing in the subsequent slides so this is the example of fucoacidosis in which when you see the gp hypo intensity as well as thalamic hypo intensity and uh, hypo intensity can go and involve up to the substantial nigra also and when you see this patient will have dysphopic feature and uh, on skeletal survey you will see this kind of skeletal dysostosis in the form of uh, inferior leaking of the vertebra and uh, proximal pointing of the uh, metacarpals and so on so when you see this kind of thing and which shows susceptibility of the global skeletus uh, on sbi images then you can raise this possibility of uh, fucoacidosis uh, so the clue is here that uh, whenever you are seeing lysosomal disorder uh, there might be underlying t2 hypo intensity this is another example of uh, lysosomal uh, disorder which can mimic and be ia uh, is the alpha manosidosis so this patient uh, they usually present with uh, prominent forehead they will have calvaral uh, thickening and macrocephaly they have coarse facial feature as uh, other sore disorder can have uh, they present with hearing loss and uh, they will have this uh, uh, globus pallidus and thalamic hypo intensity which may or may not show the susceptibility on swi so the the idea is that when you see this kind of pattern uh, hypo intensity uh, and of the thalamus globus pallidus with uh, they can have invariable amount of uh, hypomyelination also and you should always consider uh, lysosomal storage disorder as a possibility uh this is another interesting thing that we can diagnose on uh, mri itself that is the tube before that is the hypomyelination with atrophy of the pituitary gland and cerebellum so what is happening in this patient that uh, there is relative hyper intensity subtle there is mild uh, relative hyper intensity of the entire white matter of the cerebral hemisphere it's not marked as we have seen in other uh, this myelinating lipodystrophies like l2 hydroxy glutaric acid or our can never it's just a mild uh, relative hyper intensity and uh, in this disorder what happens that uh, the cordet and butamen uh they they will progressively atrophy so the basic angle show progressive atrophy uh, but the initial scan have this kind of uh, t2 hypo intensity of the globus pallidus and thalamus this can this is relative uh, hypo intensity because there is no uh, white matter myelination so they stand out so that's the reason why we see this kind of uh, apparent hypo intensity in of the globus pallidus and thalamus this patient also have uh, this kind of cerebellar uh, atrophy uh, as we can uh, see here so Uh, when you see this kind of consolidation, then uh, it is all diagnostic of tube B four hypomyelination with basal gland cerebral. Uh, so that leads to um, a few conditions that uh, they have provided in their article on chart. That which are the conditions which can have T two hypo intensity in the thalamus. So these are the some uh, conditions which may not be complete list because uh, every year uh, we come across the T one pathology which can have same kind of spectrum. Uh, and these are the disorders which can have hypomyelination with. Uh, Based on gas susceptibility, so these uh, conditions you can go through this article. It is available online. Uh, then uh, there is one uh, characteristic uh, finding called wishbone kind of appearance on SWI uh, signal intensity in late onset or type three GM one gangliosidosis. So when you uh, see a patient with uh, this kind of skeletal dysostosis with uh, posterior putamen and uh, susceptibility of globus pallidus, which is having this kind of wishbone. Uh, kind of uh, appearance then it can be a uh, late onset or type 3 uh, gm1 gangliosidosis which is almost uh, pathognomonic for these conditions there are certain disorder which will have marked cerebral as well as cerebellar atrophy and uh, because of this atrophy and neurodegeneration they can have this kind of uh, hypo intensity of the globus pallidus and uh, thalamus as you can see here this patient also have this kind of periventricular rim of hyper intensity so and uh, thinning of the uh, corpus callosum and uh, this uh, cerebellar atrophy and on mrs we can see that uh, there is reduction in dna 
so when you see this kind of group of condition uh, or group of findings uh, this is seen in the ncl so clinically uh, this patient have heterogeneous clinical regression so uh, this kind of imaging finding can aid uh, value uh, in in diagnosing the condition this patient uh, other hallmarks uh, clinical findings are visual impairment and uh, cognitive impairment and uh, when you see this kind of diffuse marked gray and white matter atrophy in cerebral hemisphere with cerebellar atrophy with uh, this kind of t2 hypotense uh, gp and thalamus always uh, think as a ncl as one of the possibility then uh, this is another uh, patient who can have a variable degree of hypomyelination or white matter abnormality but the patient if gives uh, there is history of uh, cutaneous photosensitivity dwarfism and uh, progerot like faces when when you see this kind of uh, imaging appearance of uh, variable hypomyelination or white matter signal intensity abnormality with uh, susceptibility on SWI, which is uh, calcification uh, in the basal ganglia with the cerebral atrophy uh, then this condition is called as cocaine syndrome so when you have, when there is a classical clinical abnormality with this imaging manifestation we can raise this possibility so there are certain conditions which can have a cerebral atrophy with basal ganglia susceptibility and uh, these are the examples of those conditions that you can see and moving on to the our cluster three uh, that is the t2 hyper intensity in the globus pallidus brainstem cerebellum with restricted diffusion so here they found uh, this disorders and uh, the examples uh, predominantly were the vigor battery toxicity and uh, Krebs disease and so on. So this is the uh, example of vigor battery toxicity, which is involving uh, and showing restricted different in the globus pallidus thalamus symmetrically, and also involving the brainstem tracts and the uh, dentate nucleus. Another additional finding in uh, vigor battery toxicity is that that they can involve the hypothalamus in all the cases. So when you see hypothalamic involvement with this kind of uh, uh, symmetrical finding and you have to take care that is there any history of vigabatrin drug intake and uh, this drug is useful mainly for the uh, infantile spasm and uh, these are the classical uh, features that we can see under vigabatrin toxicity so that leads to uh, there are certain conditions which can involve hypothalamus with 32 hyper intensity and these are the certain conditions out of which vigabatrin is one of them moving on to the another case is the Krebs disease which can have a globus pallidus and brain stem tract involvement, which can show restricted different in the uh, acute uh, event. And uh, the hallmark feature would be that there will be disproportionate atrophy of the brain parenchyma for the age. And uh, you will see this kind of uh, white matter hyper intensity uh, in the parieto occipital or frontoparietal regions. Uh, they will have abnormality in the plic as well as uh, corticospinal tracts in the brain stem, as well as cerebellar involvement. Uh, this patient also can have T2 hyper intensity of the thalamus. And if you do CT, you will see some sort of hyperdensity in the thalamus in these patients. So uh, the presentation of, of this condition in the child would be this patient will have a hyper irritability and neuroregression in an early infantile phase. And uh, that is the these are the hallmark features of the infantile variety of Krebs disease. And there are many other varieties which uh, which can be juvenile or adult also, which I am not taking. But uh, the infantile variety will have this kind of uh, imaging finding. And this is the uh, findings which can have optic tract thickening. I forgot to mention that uh, Krebs is one of the uh, diseases which can have this kind of optic asthma thickening, which we have seen in other disorders like Alexander can have, even uh, MLD uh, and some other conditions like uh, ADM in acute phase can have uh, optic uh, tract thickening. These are some other uh, ophthalmic abnormality which can have some other set, uh, several conditions that we can go later uh, at your ease. And then moving on to the last cluster, that is the uh, prominent T1 hyper intensity without accompanying T2 weighted uh, abnormality or DWI. So in this age group, uh, they have observed the T1 hyper intensity, which was uh, predominantly seen in hypermagnesemia group in, the, in those. And, and uh, they had found this kind of two uh, gene abnormality, SLC30A10 and SLC39A14 uh, gene abnormality in those conditions. So one of the example is this uh, manganese transporter defect that is SLC30A10. So what we are seeing here that uh, there is diffuse hyperintensity of the entire basal ganglia uh, involving the chorate, putamen, and uh, globus pallidus that we are not able to distinctly see the boundaries between them. And uh, this uh, patient also have this excessive hyperintensity in the corpus callosum. They can also have hyperintensity in the pituitary gland itself. Uh, if you see the brainstem, there is. Uh, 
the characteristic of enteral sparing and dorsal hyperintensity in the brain stem, so as the cerebellar white matter uh, involvement. So when you see this kind of involvement, uh, you should always look for uh, manganese transporter uh, defect. Uh, this kind of changes, they may not have uh, susceptibility or T2 hypointensity. So that is one way to differentiate from other uh, disorders like NBI and other conditions uh, like Wilson disease. This is an uh, example of SLC 39A14, that is also a manganese transporter defect. But here the findings are limited only to the globus pallidus. But in severe cases, it can go and involve to the other part of the globus, uh, other part of the brain, uh, basically as well. So, uh, so the one hyperintensity that can be diffused, which is uh, labeled as in this as S category, and uh, these are the reasons for the diffused T1 hyperintensity, which includes hypermagnesemia. Sometimes it can occur in Wilson disease or uh, toxicity due to FE drying. Uh, and uh, sometimes the hyperintensity can be patchy, and the patchy hyperintensity can be due to uh, basically like calcification or a sequel of some prior inflammatory disorders and uh, certain poisoning. So then uh, winding up uh, last. Last uh, category that is the disorder with basal angular calcification. Uh, so basal angular calcification can be seen in primary disorder or that can be secondary to some systemic disease or uh, metabolic disorders as mentioned in this uh, table. Or sometimes they can be associated with the monogenic disorders like ADAR, uh, certain metabolic disorders like folate deficiency and so on. Uh, here is the example of uh, calcification. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have CT uh, to show, but here we can see that uh, there are altered signal intensity in bilateral uh, basal ganglia and uh, susceptibility in the globus pallidus. But here we can see these kind of patchy areas of acetabular blooming in corded nucleus and glutamine as well, uh, plus dented nucleus in moment. This patient had uh, low calcium uh, and metabolic derangement was there, and there was history of titanium and uh, painful muscle spasm. So on uh, further workup, it came out to be hypoparathyroidism. So the clue is there that when you see this kind of striatal and globus pallidus patchy patchy areas of uh, uh, involvement which shows susceptibility, always uh, keep consideration of uh, metabolic disorders like uh, in, involving the calcium disturbance in your mind. So uh, this was the discussion about the different clusters and uh, their disease conditions. Uh, so th they had this kind of condition, but with further uh, review of literature, they, all, they also added few more 59 disease category based on, the, again, the signal changes and their differences. They also had included uh, certain adult categories because they can predominantly involve the basal ganglia and they can show susceptibility on uh, SWI, like ACE adenoplysinemia. And uh, mitochondrial disease, they have grouped as a distinct syndrome that we saw as a Kernstein syndrome or MacDill or they have uh, separated amongst the complex efficiency in this uh, article. So finally, they came up with uh, an algorithmic approach how to handle uh, bilateral basic ganglia abnormality, in which uh, we have to start first with uh, whether the uh, abnormality is seen on T2 weighted and it is showing hyperintensity of the basic ganglia or restricted diffusion on the basic ganglia. So when it shows, uh, the uh, hyperintensity or diffuse, diffuse section, then we have to uh, carefully see whether it's involving the striatum part that is quadrate of butamine or it is involving the globus pallidus part. So when it is involving the striatal part only, and if that is yes, then you can see the cluster one and uh, those kind of conditions and associated patterns that we have already seen. And if it comes to know that it may not be involving only the striatum, then you have to go to the overlapping patterns that we already discussed that a certain condition can have pallidum as well as striatal uh, environment, and you can go into that those kind of uh, differentials. Same uh, when you see T2 hyperintensity only in globus pallidus, and then you have to see that uh, category I in that table too that I already shown you that certain conditions which are only affecting the globus pallidus and which is having bright signal intensity on T2 weighted images. And you can uh, differentiate based on other features and clinical information and uh, further uh, genetic testing. So that was about the T2 hyperintensity. When you find T1 hyperintensity in basal ganglia, then you have to see that whether the abnormalities are patchy or diffuse. If it is patchy, then you have to go for differentials of the patchy T1 hyperintensity, which has been uh, which I have shown earlier uh, in the previous slides. And when the hyperintensity is diffuse uh, and but there is no susceptibility, then probably you are dealing with uh, that uh, manganese disorders, and you can go with that pattern. Uh, but if you see that uh, T1 hyperintensity with uh, SWI susceptibility then you have to see that uh, which are the areas which are involved. If uh, globus pallidus, substantia nigra, and uh, uh, subthalamic nucleus is involved, 
then uh, you have to see that what is the additional neuroimaging features. For example, is there any hypomyelination that we have seen? For example, numbers of hypomyelination with global skeletal syndrome. Is there any op optic atrophy or is there any cellular atrophy? And you can go and uh, look out the causes which can affect those conditions. And you can also, so there are certain conditions which can have the two hyperintensity of thalamus. You can go according to that chart also. And if the basal is showing susceptibility, which is predominantly in striatum, uh, that is considered as category R that we'll be seeing in the next slide. So here is the example of uh, basal ganglia hy hyperintensity, which can affect uh, predominate the striatum, which is seen in more of an adult age group, that is the acerebroplasmic pneumonia. And he, here you will see extremely low or undetectable level of uh, cerebral plasmin, uh, and you will see elevated ferritin, and uh, this uh, iron is accumulated in the this kind of specific structures in the corpus striatum and thalami. Uh, they can um, affect the cerebral cortex and gray matter also. So when you see this kind of condition, you can raise possibility of acerebroplasmin pneumonia, which is seen usually in the adult age group. And uh, these are, there are some other uh, disorders which can have susceptibility uh, or striatum. And this is the list of that thing, which is also available online. And you can go through that literature. So uh, they have also done this kind of same data representation online. And you can go on this website called Kids Neuroscience, in which uh, they have tried to make an electric tool to examine uh, differential diagnosis of bilateral, bilateral basal ganglia abnormality, like a software. And uh, when you click on this, you will be given an option of uh, pressing on this button that is called MRI diagnostic tool. When you press on that, uh, you will be seeing this kind of window in which uh, instruction will be provided. And uh, you can go into that MRI findings uh, column. And uh, in MRI findings, you can enroll your or case related data that uh, which are the structures which are involved and whether they are hyper intense or hypo intense is there any other areas of environment that we have subsequently seen in previously and so on uh, if you uh, mark these areas the software automatically will give you that these are the probable differential diagnosis of or uh, like which condition can have this kind of uh, abnormalities and if you go on to particular slide they have also provided some a uh, few uh, particular features about those conditions and uh, and many of the disease has got this kind of imaging appearance also so that's a very uh, useful software which is freely available online uh, on that uh, on that uh, article uh, link only so to summarize uh, clustering of the neuroimaging patterns will uh, help in uh, complementing the clinical information and that will aid in uh, a differential diagnosis and guiding the diagnostic testing and uh, it's a useful approach useful approach to uh, see the basal ganglia via pattern recognition. And once do you uh, recognize the main pattern, like for example, whether it is predominant globus pellitus or predominant striatal environment, whether it is showing increased susceptibility or not, or it is showing T1 diffuse hyperintensity, then you have to look for other clues on MRI, uh, either it is isolated finding or it is combined with some other structural environment, which that, that will tell you to, to further narrowing out the differentials. And there are certain disorders uh, like MSUD, Canavan, type 1 lethargic aciduria, ANEC, L2 hydroxyl lethargic aciduria. These are a disorder, they have typical imaging findings so that we can diagnose on imaging and we can be very confident. Uh, but in certain uh, conditions like chronic terrors and monoxide toxicity, the findings may not be uh, specific, but uh, here you have to take into consideration of uh, clinical history and that will help you out. So first and most thing is that you have to thorough uh, examine the child and have proper clinical information. And um, by this way, uh, pattern recognition, we can be useful to uh, uh, in evaluating some unrecognized in order, and uh, we can be useful in and give proper uh, diagnostic gene testing. So by that, uh, I would uh, I would like to conclude uh, today's article. And uh, thank you for listening to this article. I would like to thank the Department of Radiology, CMC Vellore, in which few of the cases I had uh, shown here when I was doing my periodic radiology fellowship. I would like to. Uh, thank Department of Radiology and SSSC and uh, Dr. Asik Biswas who had made a wonderful pattern-based approach on basal disorder during uh, his CMC tenure. Uh, thank you. And I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hirin. That was an excellent article and you took us through it really beautifully. Basal ganglia disorders are very commonly seen in pediatric neuroimaging and I'm sure uh, the way the approach that you've shown us will definitely help us guide the further course of management also as to what investigations, also genetic testing. 
and the algorithmic approach that you showed i'm sure will definitely help all of us uh, before we take the questions i would like to invite uh, uh, dr deepak patkar sir to kindly address the delegates uh, thank you hiran for fantastic presentation it was really really good especially the approach and the pattern uh, that's something that uh, people should remember and uh, software the artificial intelligence yeah would reduce your intelligence but i mean you should reach there first understand the sir you are not audible i think he got disconnected gauri is just uh, reconnecting yeah okay uh, dr hirin there are a couple of questions so yeah, we'll yeah, yeah. take those questions after uh, sir's address is done okay and uh, we've shared the link for the article in the chat box for those who want to go and uh, view the article correct, and if correct. you have any questions i'm sure uh, yeah, sorry 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 yes yes, yes sir yeah, yeah. the wifi went out suddenly yes. uh so thank you thank you hiran for fantastic presentation uh dear friends and colleagues it gives me immense pleasure to be addressing you on this platform of indian radiologist the radiology journal club it's a novel initiative by indian radiologists this is an endeavor to keep young radiologists updated this is our fifth radiology journal club in this monthly event we discuss a recent relevant radiology article followed by case discussion and that's what Kiran did today i would especially thank his valuable time and contribution to this extremely difficult talk and approach he has systematically taken all the delegates through a very important topic in a very very lucid manner to the people present in the webinar thank you all for keeping up the enthusiasm to understand new things learn and improve your knowledge learning is never complete and you will always find something new to learn every day that's what i feel and that's what i practice i would like to acknowledge the efforts of everyone from indian radiologists especially dr gauri dr mitusha and dr amit punkar for keeping this alive and kicking do join us for our several upcoming dedicated telemed sets of master class series focused on breast onco msk and cancer radiology we are also trying to do something on fetal imaging so subspecialty all of us know is the way forward and we at indian radiologists are trying to do that in a very systematic manner links will be shared on indian radiologist web page and of course on social media platforms thanks once again all of you for being part of today's endeavor stay safe stay connected thank you gauri and mitusha thank you sir i would just like to say thank you patkar sir and the entire team at indian radiologists for providing <laughs> us this platform and coming up with such innovative ideas like the journal club and i hope this goes on forever so thank you so much uh dr hiren i think we can take the questions there are a few okay uh, there's one which says when when will we say gp a global pal globus pallidus substantia nigra is hypo on swi any reference yeah 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 uh, so there is one article on agnr they have said about uh, this susceptibility weighted imaging uh, on globus pallidus uh, specifically your question is very valid and uh, that is very difficult because even uh, when the child in different age group they will have some sort of uh, if you see on swi sequence you will see some low signal uh, uh, intensity in those areas uh it will be not be apparent uh, in a children less than 5 years but as the children goes more than 10 years you will see some sort of uh, more like as like going kind of a high point density kind of area so the thing is that you want to ask whether when to tell pathology and when to not so that's a difficult that's a more of a eyeballing and that will be your machine specific thing and but there are certain clues that will help you the thing is that if you see only some peripheral high point density which is symmetrical and well defined and which is progressing gradually centrally that is that is called as normal uh, swi high point intensity on the globus pallidus so that should not be labeled as pathological but if you see some sort of spotted abnormality or speckled or uh, 
uh, in homogeneous appearance on uh, global spiders, which is Mary marked, uh, then you can say that uh, this is looking abnormal or pathology. Otherwise, if it is symmetrical and uh, like some sort of linear, uh, which is centripetal, like from periphery to central gradient kind of thing, then it is more likely to be uh, artifact or it is like three Tesla related uh, changes in which can be seen on SWI uh, sequences. I hope that answers your question. There were, there's one more question which says, is there any criteria to say Wormian atrophy? Yeah, yeah, that we can definitely say. Uh, so basically, uh, I would like to show you that Wormian atrophy. Any case, one minute. Yeah. So if you see this particular image, NCL, uh, so ideally the the superior omis starts from this uh, collicular level and it and it should end till the level of obex in a normal uh, population so when if you draw a line from the obex and uh, if it is not reaching the vomis is not reaching up to that level and if you see uh, some interfolial space widening that is seen here then you can tell it as a, a hormone atrophy and uh, if you don't see interfolial space widening but if you see that volume uh, vermis is small in size it is not reaching up to this uh, obex area, then you can, that could be vermian hypoplasia. Okay, so that's the difference between vermian atrophy, vermian hypoplasia and, uh, and normal finding. One more yeah. question. Uh, the ideal TE value for MRS in neonates in metabolic mitochondrial conditions? So ideally speaking, uh, neonates can have those kind of amino acidopathies and uh, organic aciduria's. So ideally, it should be done in both uh, 35 as well as 144 T. Uh, that is the low and intermediate T, uh, because the low T will pick up the uh, smaller amino acid, which can be seen only at 35 T, which will be obscured uh, at uh, intermediate T. But if you are looking for mitochondrial and those kind of disorder, it is preferably or it is ideally. Uh, recommended that uh, we should do 144 also just to look at that inverted lactate peak to be more confident about that. And in older children, what I have uh, seen that uh, MR spectroscopy at 144 will would suffice in most of the cases if we are uh, lack of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think someone's asked for the website slide again. Can you share the website slide again? Website slide again. Okay, I'll slide. So uh, when you type on Google uh, this MRI patent based approach, you will see this article. Uh, this uh, by Dr. Shakib and uh, and if you open, they will be showing that uh, the data availability and it's, they would have given this link, kidsneuroscience.org. When you click on this uh, link, it will open a new window that is the click uh, Kids Neuroscience Center in which uh, they, they have given this uh, electronic tool to examine differential diagnosis. Uh, and, and there is a, one a link for that tool. So you have to press this diagnostic tool that will download in your system, laptop or uh, desktop. And then you will be uh, opening a new, uh, that, I mean, no, new window will open. This is the, uh, that software or artificial intelligence uh, tool in which you have just have to go to the MRI findings. You have to mention that what are the structures which are involved cotted, putam, and globus pellitus, and you have to see that any other areas of involvement, T1 hyperintensity, hypointensity, susceptibility, all kind of information they have put here. You have to click just that thing, and uh, based on your clicking, uh, the computer will give you a certain disorder that can have similar structures of involvement. And then you uh, clinically correlate that, which are the things which are uh, best fitting with those cannabis. Uh, just to tell you that this study also had limitation because uh, the study population was only from the this thing Sydney, UK mainly, and uh, those kind of population. And uh, it it has done only the MRI available to them during those time. The thing is that uh, this metabolic disorders and certain condition they evolve over time, and the classical imaging features they can uh, evident later in the same patient. So you might not uh, see the same uh, finding if you scan and the patient early. So this may not be absolute software, but it's a good try to see some differentials. Um, for example, they had very few cases of infective encephalitis involving the voice and all. But I would expect that if it was India, uh, we would have expected more of an infective encephalitis involving the voice ganglia. 
so that kind of uh, changes will be there uh, because we have different cohort of patient in our population. Uh, yeah. Oh, there's one more question. How hmm. to differentiate LAS from Banda's imaging wise? Imaging wise, it's uh, difficult. It's difficult because some if it is symmetrical uh, and if it's showing this kind of sagittal necrosis, which can happen in both of the conditions, uh, it is difficult. But uh, if the legs is having some other uh, findings like uh, involvement of the subthalamic nucleus, involvement of the brainstem tracts, uh, which are uh, which are periaqueductal or involving the substantia nigra, then you can uh, uh, confidently say that this looks like more of a leaks. This is secondary to mitochondrial. Uh, in that also, the subthalamic nucleus is more commonly involved in in Cox deficiency or subfamilial mutation. But uh, uh, if in an unknown case with only that patient abnormality which is symmetrical, you have to more rely on clinical finding rather than uh, imaging finding. Other thing you can try out the uh, MR spectroscopy and in, in different area which are not showing signal abnormality. If you are seeing some sort of uh, lactate peak in normal wing areas, then you can raise that might be uh, leaks this is secondary to mitochondrial. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hiren. I think that covers all the uh, questions. Uh, thank you once again for uh, really taking that and for your time on a Sunday morning. Thank you so much. We will uh, share, I'll try to share the link once again in the chat box. I think a few people are not able to open the link. And I'm sure if anybody has any questions, they can always reach out to you, Dr. Hiren. Yeah, yeah, they can always reach out. Uh, I'm sorry, I have not put my email ID, but- uh, You can share the email ID in the chat box. That's also fine. Yeah, I'll just uh, share my email ID. All these videos will be available on the Indian Radiologist YouTube channel as well. So please do visit the website and also check out the channel also for more academic videos, similar videos and all the Radiology Journal Club videos are also available. So you can go and check them out uh, later. And if you have any queries, any doubts, you can always reach out to any of us, me, Dr. Mitusha uh, and the other uh, uh, speakers who've been with us uh, so far. Thank you, everyone, once again. Thank you, Dr. Hiren. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank uh, you once again for inviting me. I hope uh, they could have learned something from this lecture. I'm sure they must have. Yeah. Definitely. There are a lot of positive comments also coming up. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank Dr. You. Amit, we can have the sponsor videos once more, please. We'll see you all next month with another journal club. <laughs>
of successful installations all over the country with satisfied and happy clients. Our warehouse has the largest inventory of MRI parts and upgrades. Our sales and service teams work in coordination for smooth planning and executions. Our strong network of support and service staff is expanded all over India and is always ready to help you serve. Thank you all for patiently listening to us.